Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Rabbit Breeding, Standards and Practices presented by Katherine Cavanaugh. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. To learn more about LabRoots, please visit labroots.com. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice uh, that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. Now I'd like to introduce Katherine Cavanaugh. Katherine Cavanaugh is a UC Davis graduate with a BS in Animal Science. She is currently an ICUC coordinator at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Prior to her position at UT Southwestern, she worked as a breeding coordinator managing a breeding colony of Dutch belted rabbits. She has spoken at the National ALAS meetings on the topics of establishment of novel iCook guidelines for evaluation of mild traumatic brain injury devices for mice and rats and early pregnancy determination and daily observations of fetal development via ultrasonography in Dutch belted rabbits. Please join me in welcoming Catherine. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Christina, and hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Um, today I'll be discussing um, basic rabbit breeding and also some tips and tricks, and these tricks are for rabbits and not for kids. Okay, so a little bit about my personal experience. I bred Dutch Belt rabbits. Uh, we used natural breedings, um, so we didn't use hormone manipulation um, or artificial insemination. It was all natural breeding pairs. Um, and we used offspring um, to use as uh, replacement breeders. We used ultrasound imaging in order to determine pregnancy, and we weaned rabbits at 28 to 30 days. So um, going over a little bit of glossary before we get started, these are common terms I'm going to be using throughout the presentation. A doe is a female rabbit. Um, a buck is a male rabbit. Um, Kindle means when a rabbit gives birth. Um, a nest box is a box that you place into a doe's enclosure um, near the time that she's going to kindle. Um, and this is what she's going to build her nest into and what she will kindle into. And a kit is a juvenile rabbit. Okay, so some environmental um, factors. Uh, these are some steps you can take to set up your breeding room to increase productivity. Um, first is light cycle. Um, you're going to want to mimic longer days, which are conducive for rabbit breeding. Um, so you're going to want to set up your light cycle to be a 16-hour light and an 8-hour dark cycle. Um, diet, I know that diet isn't really an environmental factor, but it is something that is in your control to help um, increase pro overall productivity by ensuring that your breeding rabbits as well as your older rabbits um, are getting appropriate nutrition. Um, so in our colony, our breeding does and our younger rabbits were on the same diet. Um, and then for our breeding bucks, as well as our older rabbits um, that were over a few months of age, were on a more traditional high fiber rabbit diet. So I definitely suggest um, contacting your feed vendor uh, that you're normally working with um, to discuss options that would be um, best suited to the needs and ages of your colony. Um, also providing hay, um, loose hay, we would typically give to our breeders and our kits. Um, we noticed that the kits had trouble with hay cubes, so we opted to give them loose hay. And then for our older rabbits, we would give the cubes. Um, also, there's been some work done on evaluating the benefits of placing um, males in the same room as your uh, female breeding rabbits, your breeding does. 
um, and also uh, and their effects on uh, being receptive to breeding. Um, and also giving them visual contact has been shown to increase that receptive receptivity to breeding as well. So we use this in our colony. So we would have our breeding does facing our breeding bucks um, with visual contact um, in closer proximity. And um, speaking anecdotally, um, this seemed to work very well. We had um, very high reception, receptive rates when we would pair our does with our bucks. So it is something that I would suggest doing. Okay, so enrichment. Uh, crowd favorites by far were anything that made noise, especially sort of metal items that would clang against their enclosure door inside their enclosure. Um, so we used hanging metal chains um, and rattles, and this was just affixed to their cage door, so it was easy for cleaning. It just became a permanent fixture within the cage that went through um, cage washing with the cage. Um, whisks were another great item. Um, I bought whisks from a like a, a chef supply warehouse sort of website, so they were very inexpensive. And these could either be hang on, hung on the enclosure door or just be placed on the floor of the enclosure. Either way, they were great as uh, loose hay feeders, as well as even without hay in them, the rabbits love to just sort of nudge these around or sort of jingle them against the cage door. Uh, we also used auditory enrichment. We had a stereo within our room that we would um, play CDs or had an auxiliary um, hookup so we could plug in our phones. The, um, you do want to be very careful with the music that you select. Rabbits like a very calm setting. So we would play like classical music or new age music. Um, the Enya Pandora station was a common station on in our rabbit room. It was nice and calm. Um, classical music. Uh, if it has a lot of sort of ups and downs and crescendos and things like that, it can be a little startling. So just be mindful of the sort of music that you're playing in the room. Um, at the very least, it provided a white noise background within the room. So things such as doors opening or doors closing, or I mentioned those noisemakers sort of clanging. Um, without the music, it could provide a little bit of a startle. Um, to the rabbits, but with the music on, it provided a nice background noise that sort of kept everyone in a calm sort of spirit. Um, if you are going to use music, definitely consult the guide um, on kind of provisions that they have about um, music and noise in rooms. Um, I've included some notes here. Um, they do say uh, keep it below 85 decibels. Uh, make sure that it is uh, the using music is part of your enrichment program. Um, so something that would may perhaps need to be approved by your IACUC or um, just within an SOP that you maintain um, so that it's an actual part of your enrichment program documented. Um, and also uh, recommending to turn it off at the end of the working day. So that's what we did. We would come in in the morning and turn on the stereo um, and have it playing during the hours that we were um, working on site. And then we would go home for the day. Our last thing would be to turn off the stereo. Okay, so getting into breeding. Um, sexual maturity, so I'm using the abbreviation DB, that just means Dutch belts. Um, so for Dutch belt females, sexual maturity was about four months of age, and for Dutch belt males, it was about five months of age. Now for larger breeds, you're going to see um, more delayed um, sexual maturity timeline. So for instance, the New Zealand white, you may not get sexual maturity for your females until perhaps five months, and for your males even perhaps closer to six months. Um, much of the information I'll be presenting today is applied to rabbits in general. It's not breed-specific information, but if I do have things that are breed-specific, I'll make sure to make a note that I'm speaking specifically to Dutch belts. So for these ages of sexual maturity, four and five months is more specific to Dutch belts. Okay, another key of maintaining a successful breeding colony is record keeping. This is going to keep you organized, and it's also going to help you keep track of your breeder's performance to help you make smart decisions about selective breeding, um, who you want to choose offspring of to be future breeders, and who perhaps you want to consider taking out of your program. Um, so the, in, the indications I have in black here are um, more of your calendar dates that you want to keep um, things organized with. And then the indications in red are your more performance records that you want to keep. So starting with date of breeding, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's the date that you um, pair your rabbits together that they're going to be breeding. 
when you pair them together, you're going to observe them and give them a copulation score. A copulation score means if there was a successful copulation observed during the breeding round. Um, so I used a copulation system of one or zero. It was basically a pass or fail grade. If I saw that when I paired the rabbits together, there was a successful copulation, I would give them a score of one. If I paired them together and there was no successful kind of breeding event, then I would give them a score of zero. Um, date of pregnancy evaluation. So this is going to be determined by your date of breeding, and it's going to be dependent on the method of pregnancy determination that you're using. Um, when you do your pregnancy determination, um, you're then going to give a pregnancy score, and this is just a yes or no whether they're pregnant or they're not pregnant. Um, the date of nest box placement. So you're going to place your nest box within the enclosure 28 days post copulation. So it's going to be 28 days after your breeding date. Um, and so the date of nest box placement is again going to be determined by your date of breeding. Um, your date of kindling is, will be dictated by your date of breeding, but kindling is a little bit uh, more of a range. It's not a definite date. Um, so you'll just have to kind of mark a range on your calendar of expected dates of kindling based off of the date that you bred the rabbit. Um, a, a performance record at kindling is um, to notate the size of the litter that the doe had. Um, and the uh, date of rebreeding, okay, so this is going to be now dictated by your date of kindling. You're going to want to allow an appropriate resting period um, for your doe um, between the date that she kindles and the date that you rebreed her. Um, and then when you do rebreed her, you're going to want to give a copulation score. And again, this just goes down the cascade of dates again. Um, and then date of weaning. Your date of weaning is going to be dictated by your date of kindling. Um, typically about 28 to 30 days um, after kindling, you can go ahead and wean. And you're going to uh, want to notate a mortality rate. So just like you notated a litter size at the time of kindling, you're going to want to notate the litter size at the time of weaning to determine any sort of mortality rate that there was. Okay, so continuing on with breeding. Um, so now you're ready to start breeding. Always bring the doe to the buck. You can either bring the doe to the buck's enclosure and place her in with the buck, or you can use a neutral space. Um, if you use a neutral space, I would suggest you grab the buck first, place him in the neutral area, and then go back and grab your doe and place her um, in that neutral space with the buck. Um, as soon as you pair the rabbits together, watch them closely. Um, rounds of copulation will go very fast, and you don't want to miss anything. Um, so I'm going to give you a breakdown of what a successful round of copulation is. So first, you'll probably see a little bit of chasing behavior. Um, this is the, the buck chasing the doe. Then he's going to mount her from behind. Um, you're going to see some rapid pelvic movement. And then your finale is going to be um, the buck's feet are going to buckle under him a bit, and he's going to give a fall to the side or a fall backwards. And as soon as you see that sort of feet buckling in a, like a temporary paralysis and a fall, that's going to give you the signal to go ahead and give a positive copulation score. Uh, that's going to notate a, a successful copulation. Um, when pairing rabbits together, I do suggest leaving them together for um, a few rounds of copulation. Um, this is going to increase your chances of conception. Rabbits are induced ovulators, so how they ovulate, they, they ovulate based off of stimulation they feel during copulation. So it's the act of copulation itself that makes them ovulate. So the more stimulation you have, the better chances you're going to have for conception. Also, obviously, more sperm deposit by the buck. Um, something you want to watch closely during pairing is signs of aggression. This is going to be signs of aggression um, by the doe towards the buck. Um, I've never experienced aggression from a buck towards a doe. Typically, the bucks are very excited for breeding day. Um, and the does are most of the time excited, um, but sometimes they can be observed to be a little bit aggressive, which means they're just not receptive at that time. Um, typically, signs of it, there's a difference between chasing and aggression, though. Just because you see some chasing behavior doesn't mean that you should pull the doe out of the enclosure. That's pretty typical at the start of a copulation round. Um, so, but actual aggression, she'll do an about face 
and face the buck and will try to start kind of biting at him and showing aggressive behavior at that point, you'll take her out of the enclosure, return her to her own space, and wait at least one day before trying to pair her again. Okay, so breeding still continue. Um, continuing, um, buck performance. So there is something called buck fatigue. This is basically the point in the day where a buck would reach sexual exhaustion. Um, if he does reach exhaustion, then you will wait uh, and pair him the next day, kind of give him about a 24 hours resting period. And you'll note buck exhaustion because they will no longer mount a female. They may act a little disinterested if she's in the cage. That's going to notate that he's sort of done for the day, and you're going to give, want to give him a little bit of resting time. Um, a typical ratio, a buck to doe ratio uh, for Dutch belts, to my experience, has been about a three to one ratio. So I would breed um, about 10 does within a day, and I would use about three bucks in order to service those 10 does. So rebreeding of does. Does will be receptive to breeding um, after kindling, uh, soon after kindling, but I do not suggest rebreeding right away because you will wear out your breeders and your breeders are very important sources. Um, so you don't want to wear out an experienced mother. You want to try to keep her as active as possible until her performance starts to decrease. So allow them appropriate resting time between the time that they kindle and the time that you rebreed them. Um, a minimum of 14 days is recommended. In my experience, we use closer to a 16 to 18 day resting period. Um, so in essence, she will be nursing um, her current litter while she's gestating her next litter. Um, so if you are using a practice where you're rebreeding while she's still nursing a litter, make sure you're weaning her first litter um, at you know that close to 28 day mark um, so that you're then allowing her again time between when you've weaned her first litter and then she's going to be kindling her next litter. Before rebreeding, always do a body condition score evaluation. Some of the challenges with Dutch belt rabbits, they're, they're about a, a medium to kind of smaller breed. So uh, tip, sometimes the resting period would not, even up to 18 days, uh, they just wouldn't be ready for rebreeding. So you want to take an inventory of if she, is she going to have the body resources to not only finish uh, her lactation of her current litter, but finish a gestation of that next litter and lactation of that litter that she, the second litter that she'll kindle. So doing a body condition score will allow you to evaluate if you want to rebreed her at that time. If you notice that she's, she doesn't seem to have the body resources to um, be rebred at that time, I like to keep a few rabbits on retainer um, and pull in sort of a substitute um, and breed a substitute and allow um, that particular doe a little bit more resting time. Okay, so um, moving on to pregnancy determination. Um, the primary method of pregnancy determination for rabbits is palpation. This is the um, manual feeling of the lower abdomen um, using your hand. So you'll slide your hand under the rabbit and feel in its lower abdominal area. And what you're feeling for are sort of grape-like structures, these sorts of uh, round nodules um, in the lower abdomen. And that's going to indicate a presence of kits, a litter. Um, it does require training. There is quite a bit of a learning curve to get a hand for palpation, and there can be a challenge with accuracy. Um, I tried palpation many, many times, and I never really developed quite the hand for it, so I was very fortunate that we had an ultrasound unit um, on site at the institution um, that I could kind of explore using for pregnancy determination, which is what I did, and that was our method of pregnancy determination that we used. So ultrasound allows for early and accurate pregnancy determination um, at about days five to seven post-copulation. It does require a bit of training um, to train your eye as to what you're looking for um, when you're ultrasounding a rabbit, where you're ultrasounding, kind of where you position the probe and the structures you're looking for to indicate that a rabbit is pregnant. Um, but I found that it was much easier to train my eye for ultrasound rather than my hand for palpation. 
A drawback of using ultrasound is that the equipment is expensive. Um, you'll definitely have to budget it into your program. Um, but early and accurate pregnancy results are something that's going to be invaluable to breeders when you're breeding time is money. So if you're able to, to determine pregnancy at five to seven days and maybe rebreed a, a doe that's not pregnant versus waiting 10 to 14 days, it makes a big difference. Okay, so I want to um, elaborate a little bit on the process of using an ultrasound um, in rabbits for pregnancy determination. There are some existing sources out there which can serve as an excellent starting point, but I found that some of the images were a little bit hard to determine um, what exactly was you, you were looking for. Um, and also it didn't have very user-friendly guide of how to prep the rabbit for ultrasound and um, how to sort of position the probe and where to position it on the rabbit. So I'll go through um, and share some of my tips. So first you want to restrain the rabbit. You can see here in the picture it's in a dorsal recumbency. Um, what you don't see in the picture is that the restrainer has the head tucked under its arm. So it's basically like a typical kind of football hold that you do for a rabbit, except that they're belly up. So restrain the rabbit, you're going to want to shave a small area, apply your ultrasound gel, and position your probe. Um, it's in a sagittal orientation, so it's basically kind of parallel with their teeth line. Okay, so development starts more caudal and moves a bit more cranial. So for the purposes of early pregnancy determination within, um, you know, I, like I said about that one week mark, um, you're going to want to use the pelvic bone, the, excuse me, yeah, the pubic bone and the uh, most caudal teat line as your area of interest to shave and position your probe. If you're evaluating sort of fetal development later in the gestation cycle, then you want to use the uh, first and second most caudal teats as your point of interest. Okay, so starting at day five, um, figure one, this is what, first of all, you're going to want to, lo to locate um, when you're imaging, and it's the uterine lumen. All of the vesicles, basically all of the action is happening in the uterine lumen. So that's what you want to isolate first. Um, you'll notice that it sort of has uh, two lines and then an anechoic sort of uh, lumen to it. Um, and then in figure two, what you're going to be looking for within that lumen are these circular vesicles. Uh, they have an echogenic ring around them with an anechoic center. Uh, at day five, these vesicles are very small. They're about 0.3 centimeters in diameter. Day five is early in, in gestation and can be challenging to locate these vesicles. But if you keep this image in mind, figure two, I'm going to flip to day six. You can see what a drastic difference it is and kind of how much easier on day six it is to pick up these vesicles. They're larger in size. They've grown to about 0.4 centimeters in diameter. They have an anechoic center and an echogenic ring. Um, the difference in like the light they're, they're picking up uh, is more drastic at day six than you saw at day five. Um, and in figure two, this is another example. Now, when you have the probe, uh, positioned on the rabbit. The vesicles will sort of uh, what we call wink at you and it's basically you'll see that figure two the darker portion in the center isn't as drastic as in figure one but if you were to see something like this in figure two if you were to wiggle your probe a little bit I'll kind of get on if you were to just wiggle your probe from side to side you may see that the, the light difference would become more drastic and you would see a uh, kind of a vesicle blink or like I said wink at you so if you do see something that you think is a vesicle, go ahead and keep your probe in the same position and sort of just move side to side and see if you can kind of catch it at a better angle. Um, I should mention that when you see these vesicles, this is what is determining that the rabbit is pregnant. So as soon as you see these vesicles, you can move on to the next rabbit and start the process. Um, okay, so day seven in ultrasound. So figure one, um, I've kind of outlined a structure between these orange lines that the yellow arrow is pointing at. Um, this is actually the point of implantation um, along the, the uterine wall. 
um, which is a very interesting structure to observe. So th at this point, um, the vesicle is actually implanted, um, and you can see that there are two vesicles present in figure one. Um, the average size uh, at day seven is close to 0.6 centimeters in diameter. Um, figure two, you'll see a green arrow pointed to sort of a shaded part within the vesicle, and that's the start of a formation of placental tissue. So day eight, uh, very easy to um, determine vesicles in day eight as well. And you can see that the shading portion has become much larger. This is the placental tissue developing, and you can actually start it sort of start to cleave in um, on itself, as indicated with the blue arrows. Um, and these vesicles are much larger in size. They're actually getting close to about one centimeter in diameter at this point. So these are your days that you would want to evaluate the rabbit for pregnancy determination. I do have a few more images I want to show you out of interest to show you, if you may remember, I said palpation could be done starting at day 10 to 14 of copulation. So I want to show you what development looks like up to day 14, just to show you how much development actually happens by the time that you would be able to even use palpation as a method to determine if they were pregnant. Um, so this is, uh, these images are representative of uh, development at day 9 and 10. Figure 1 is day 9, as indicated with the red arrow, it's pointing to an embryo becomes visible by day 9. Figure 2 is from day 10 of gestation, and it, it, the blue arrow is actually pointing to an umbilical connection between the um, embryo um, and the placental tissue. Day 11 is a really exciting day um, for ultrasounding. Um, we, it's the first day that a heartbeat is visible. Um, I always thought of ultrasounding as sort of getting a sneak peek at the kits up and coming. Um, so observing a heartbeat was really exciting. Um, the heart is about 0.2 centimeters in diameter. It's calipered in figure one um, between the two um, A calipers. And in figure two, I have a yellow arrow pointing to sort of the echogenic sort of circular structure that's um, within um, sort of the middle of the embryo and the chest cavity. So day 12 and 13, um, in the day, figure one, day 12 photo, the blue arrow, you can see the amniotic sac um, outlining the embryo at this point. Um, in day 13, the blue arrow, again, pointing to an amniotic um, sac and the yellow arrow, you can actually start to see the formation of a mus musculoskeletal structure at this point. And day 14, this is the last Im image, these are the last images I'll be sharing with you. Um, you can see the development of forelimbs by day 14, as well as you start to see some sophistication within um, the cranial structures. The purple arrow is pointing to an eye socket. Um, okay, so to wrap up with ultrasound, we had a really interesting case of resorption. So I want to point out that we didn't ultrasound our rabbits every day. We did a, a special project with um, two groups of uh, gestating um, does that we, we had. We thought it would be interesting and valuable to chronicle fetal development um, from the time of pregnancy determination up to day 28 when we placed the nest box into the enclosure. Um, that way, if we ever wanted to ultrasound a female to sort of evaluate um, the health of the litter or sort of development of the litter, we would know what normal development looked like. And so we could kind of compare um, what, you know, our stock photos at a certain day looked like versus if we were evaluating a rabbit in, in live time. So when we were sort of doing that project, uh, we were imaging a, a particular doe, and from day 7 to 14, it was completely normal development. Vesicles were determined early on, embryos were present, um, and then day 15 and 16, we saw all empty vesicles. And then day 17, we continued to image her. On day 17, we noted one live fetus. So it was a fetus that we missed on day 15 and 16. Um, and then at the end of her gestation cycle, she did only kindle one kit. And without the use of ultrasound, we would have been left wondering why the rabbit of litter-bearing species would only kindle one kit, kind of how that happened. Um, but because we had been ultrasounding her, we actually knew it was because of a case of resorption. It wasn't because she got pregnant with only one kit initially. It was that she was pregnant with a litter, resorbed all but one kit, and that's what she ended up with at the end of gestation. 
So some final conclusions about ultrasound. It provides an accurate and efficient method of pregnancy determination. It's a useful tool for evaluating fetal development as well as health status. Um, and it provides insightful information about your dose performance, um, as I just explained with their case of resorption. Okay, so moving away from pregnancy determination and getting back on track with gestation and kindling. Um, gestation, a typical range of gestation for a rabbit is 29 to 35 days. I know that that's a bit of a wide range. Um, from personal experience, our big days for kindling were 30 to 32 days um, into gestation. And our most popular period was the dark period between day 30 and day 31. Uh, PC is post-copulation. Um, nest box placement. So you want to place the nest box into the enclosure on day 28 post-copulation, so 28 days into her gestation cycle. Day 28, it, you don't really want to place it in earlier because she will just use that box sort of as a latrine area, um, which is undesirable. And you don't want to place it in any later because you want to give her enough time to prepare her nest and then you know, actually kindle her litter into the nest box. So day 28 has been widely accepted as the date to place the nest box into the enclosure. You'll fill the nest box with soft bedding, and I like to provide loose hay in the enclosure at this time as well, or ensure that they had loose hay available in the enclosure at the time that I was putting the nest box in. A lot of the does would take that loose hay and actually bring it into the nest box as part of nesting material, and it was sort of them foraging for nesting material um, and bringing it into the nest box, which just facilitated positive nest building behavior. Per the Animal, Animal Welfare Act, a nest box with clean nesting materials must be provided for a doe with a litter, so it's actually built into the regulations that a nest box be provided. Um, rabbits will pull fur from their chest and put it in the nest box. Um, if you observe that she is building a nest outside of the nest box, I would suggest moving the nest box to where she's building the nest and putting that fur that she's pulled inside of the nest box. This will hopefully cue her in that she's supposed to be using this box as, um, as the place to kindle in and be building her nest. Um, so expected litter size. For our Dutch belts, we had an average number of about seven kits per litter, six to seven. Um, we did have some that would consistently have higher numbers. Um, we had some that would have closer to 10 kits consistently. Well, we had some that would more err on the side of about six. So it averaged to about a number of seven as an average. For New Zealand or your larger breeds, such as New Zealand whites, you'll see this litter number increase. I believe for New Zealand whites, I've read a figure of about eight to 14 kits um, as to be an expected uh, litter size. Okay, nest box checks and handling. So after your doe kindles, you want to incorporate nest box checks as a daily part of your routine. Um, this can be twofold. One, you're observing that they are developing and that they're being fed. And secondly, um, you can start to handle them. And this promotes um, a socialization program that you're starting early on um, that has been shown to be beneficial and have lasting effects as rabbits develop, um, and they'll be more used to human contact. If you start that socialization very early, it'll have lasting effects later in their life. Um, Dutch belts are known to be a bit more wild, a bit more of a difficult lab subject than um, their New Zealand counterparts. So as a Dutch belt breeder, I was really on a mission to break that stereotype and just make the nicest, calmest Dutch belts in the business. Um, and our socialization program definitely um, helped to accomplish that. So for kit observations, you want to observe if they're fed or not fed. So a fed rabbit will be easy to, a fed kit will be easy to pick out. They'll be plump in appearance. They'll have sort of a rounded abdomen shape. If you were to look at them from the back, sort of from the rump, they'll have sort of their belly will be bowed out on each side. Um, and they'll have, their skin will have a smooth appearance to it. Not fed, you're going to see that they have a flat or even kind of sunken in abdomen, and they're going to have wrinkled skin. The reason their skin is going to be wrinkled is because they're dehydrated. Um, when you're doing your checks, you also want to count your litter each day. So you want to get an initial litter count starting day one, um, and then every day thereon, you want to count and make sure that 
a kit isn't sort of roaming around in the nest box away from the huddle. Um, hypothermia is a kind of a big threat to kits. Um, so you want to ensure that they are within the nest box and that they are huddled with their other litter mates for heat insulation. Um, also, if you count and you notice that um, one of the kits has died since the last nest box check, you want to remove them from the nest box immediately. So as you're observing them, this is your opportunity to go ahead and start socializing them. So you want to start handling them as soon as day one. Um, this is a bit controversial whether you can start handling them as, as early as day one or if you want to kind of let... Uh, not kind of scare the doe and wait a few days before going in to handle them. Um, our breeders were very familiar with um, us, the, the staff that was working with them. So we went in as soon as day one, always using um, gloved hands to handle the kits um, without problems of does sort of rejecting their litter. That was not the case. So we would go in as soon as day one. We would pick each one up individually, um, conduct our health observation, um, and then we would orient it in different positions in our hands, sort of turn it over in your hand um, and touch each of its feet and sort of just hold it for a little while. Um, and when the kids are very squirmy, so when you're holding them, um, make sure you're holding them over the nest box. Don't hold them from sort of a great height over the floor. You're going to want to hold them sort of over the nest box because they are very squirmy. Okay, so rabbits can be very successful foster moms. Um, successful fostering, you do want to foster, if you do decide to foster, I would suggest try to foster earlier rather than later. Um, some of the reasons you would be interested in fostering is that if you start to see um, a size disparity between your litter, so basically maybe one to two kits will be falling behind um, in size versus the other ones because they are competing for the teat and maybe not getting as much access as other kits in the litter. So you may want to foster to sort of even out litter sizes to allow those smaller rabbits a better chance um, at access and overall survival. So the, and the size disparage, disparage becomes drastic um, very soon. So that's why I suggest kind of trying to foster within the first few days um, if that's the route you're going to go. So when you are placing a new kit into their new nest box, um, distract the doe a little bit. You can go ahead and place a treat in her enclosure at this time. Um, maybe give her her hay for the day at that time. Um, rub a little bit of the bedding from the nest box that they're being transferred to on the kit. Um, or if there is a bit of um, urine available, you can rub it on the kit as well. Um, urine from the dough. Um, rub it on the kit and then place it into the nest box. Um, try to, when you're fostering kits, try to choose a kit that is of a similar size um, to the litter that you're fostering it to. So like I said, if there's a kit that's sort of falling behind in development, you may not necessarily always want to choose that smaller kit as the one you want to foster out. You may want to choose, if you're fostering it to a litter of even larger kits than the, the original litter, then you may want to choose one of the larger kits of the litter and choose that as the one that you're fostering out. So um, advantages of fostering, so why you foster, evening out litter sizes. This can accommodate breeders with larger litters, litters but have higher mortality rates um, by the time that they're weaning their litters. So I had a rabbit that consistently had about 10 kits per litter, which is a sizable litter for a Dutch belt. And, but she had problems keeping all of those kits um, to weaning, whereas I had another doe that had consistently lower litters but was an excellent foster mom. So I would make sure to keep those two does within the same breeding group. And then when it came time, um, that doe would have about 10 kits. The other doe would have six kits. I would take two of the kits from the litter of 10 and add it to that litter of six, and that would make an equal litter size of eight for both of those does. And that trick worked really well. So um, moving on to weaning. Um, I suggest weaning and group housing um, as one step. So the minimum age of weaning is 28 days. Um, we weaned between 28 and 30 days. Uh, when we wean, we would pair siblings of the same sex together into their new enclosure. Um, if we had an odd number uh, of rabbits in the litter, we would pair uh, them with the uh, another litter of the same gender. 
Um, so from litter A and litter B, there's odd numbers. There's a male from litter A left over and a male from litter B left over. We would put them in the same enclosure. We didn't notice any difference between um, successful pairings of actual genetic siblings versus ones that we had just paired together at the time of weaning. At that point, they're young enough that they get accustomed to the group housing, and that sort of genetic difference doesn't make a, an impact long term. So our most common results of pair housing were successful pairings. Um, most rabbits that were paired together at weaning stayed peacefully paired until the time that we shipped out our rabbits. We shipped out our rabbits at the age of about five to six months of age. Um, we provided multiple enrichment items within the enclosure, as well as provided enough hay for both. Uh, providing enough resources for the both rabbits uh, decreased the amount of competition that there was, like over enrichment items or perhaps over a hay cube. Just go ahead and provide you know, two, even three in there to decrease the competition. So uh, we did have to separate occasionally. Um, reasons for separation were excessive chasing that did not resolve with a dominance being established. Dominance in pair housing is not something that should be frowned upon. It actually works to an advantage if they do establish some sort of a hierarchy between the pair. Um, so pairs that struggle to establish dominance would engage in a sort of constant sort of chasing behavior. They would sometimes mount each other and then chase and chase and chase. So if we ex notice that excessive chasing, even if it didn't get to the level of aggression, but just that dominance was not being established over a few days, then we would uh, separate those rabbits. So another sign for separation is, aggress is aggression. They'll do an about face to each other and they'll um, try to bite each other or, or they'll go into this sort of boxing behavior where they'll rear up on their back legs and then sort of fight with their front paws. And at that point when you see aggressive behavior, you'll want to separate. Anytime we sep separate rabbits, we would notate on their cage card the date of separation and the reason why they were separated. Um, and then males versus females in a group house setting. So we had successful pairings of both um, male Dutch belts as well as female Dutch belts. Um, the females tended to show signs of dominance or aggression before males, and this was closely associated with the timing of sexual maturity. Um, I, may, I did mention that we shipped males out at about five to six months of age. So full disclosure, males do reach sexual maturity about you know, five months of age for Dutch belts. So we may have seen increased success for males because we were shipping them out at the time of, around the time of sexual maturity. Although I will say even the males that we shipped out at later times, like closer to the six month mark, when they would have sexually matured about perhaps a month previous to that, we still did see successful pairings. So some acknowledgements, I'd like to acknowledge absorption systems. That's the institution that I worked at as a breeding coordinator managing this Dutch Belt rabbit colony that I've been speaking about. Um, I hope you can gather from this presentation how kind of close rabbit breeding is to my heart and I'll forever be grateful to absorption systems for the opportunity that they gave me um, managing that colony. Also, the images provided for the ultrasound portion of the presentation um, were captured on equipment um, at absorption systems. And then here are some helpful references for some of the information presented today. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in. Um, I think we have some time for question and answers if we want to uh, go over some of the questions that we're receiving. Thank you, Catherine, for that informative presentation. It's time for the Q&A uh, session. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Um, type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click the send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Um, our first question of the day asks, when you say uh, when you say you leave does and bucks together for multiple rounds of copulation, uh, how many do you expect to see? Hi.
Hi. Um, okay, thank you for the question. Um, so when I say multiple rounds of copulation, I mean um, at least two rounds, perhaps three rounds. Um, once you see two to three rounds, you can take the dough back to her original enclosure. Excellent. Thank you for that informative uh, answer. Um, our second question, how long should you leave bucks and does together when breeding them? I'm sorry. I'm catching up on the question. I think it was how long should you leave bucks and does together when breeding them? Um, so, like I said, this is a good follow-up question to the last one. So, for two to three rounds of um, copulation, you'll want to observe them for a few minutes. I would say up to about a 10-minute period would be sufficient for observing them. At that point, after 10 minutes, you're probably not going to see uh, more action. So, even if you've just seen one round of copulation, I would separate at that time. Hopefully, you would have seen about two rounds of copulation with up to a 10-minute period. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions here. Um, how do does react when handling her kids? Um, okay, so Doe, how does she react when handling kits? Um, she, so like I said, our breeders are very familiar with the staff um, that did our nest box checks, which I think worked to our advantage. So it may be helpful to establish um, one to two people that do your nest box checks. So uh, they reacted really well. I think you can take that as an opportunity to spend a little time with your breeder as well. I mean, nest box checks don't have to just be about the nest box. That can be the time when you introduce a treat to your, to your breeder, you know, greet her. I, I said hello to her. I don't, that baby is a little crazy, but um, you know, greet your your breeding doe first. You know, give her her hay, give her a treat, and then go ahead and proceed with the nest box check. Wonderful, thank you so much. And um, how long do the kits stay in the nest box? So rabbits will open their eyes at about 10 to 14 days of age. Um, at that point, you may start to see some exploration outside of the nest box. Um, definitely between two to three weeks of age is the point in which you're going to see the most exploration outside the nest box. By the age of three weeks, they are fully mobile inside, um, in, in and out of the nest box. Thank you for that. And it looks like uh, we only have time for this last question. Um, how much bedding should be added to the nest box? I think the question was how, how much bedding is in the nest box. Um, I, I didn't use an exact measurement of how much bedding I was adding to the nest box. If I had to estimate, I would say about two inches worth. My suggestion for, for the bedding for the nest box, um, when choosing a bedding to fill your nest box, you want something that has sort of a natural volume to it already. I found that um, vendors were very open to sending some samples initially um, for us to sort of try which ones were going to be more successful than others. Um, one of our least successful ones was sort of a they were sort of paper square um, chips, and they just didn't have much natural volume to them. They kind of just laid flat within the nest box. Whereas another one was a more sort of shredded, natural fibrous material. It was almost as if like 
cardboard had sort of been like gone through a wood chipper. Um, and that had some natural volume when you hold it in your hand, when you held it in your hand, um, and also created sort of a voluminous nesting material within the box as well. I'd want again like to thank Catherine Cavanaugh for her presentation. Do you have any final comments, Catherine? Thank you, everyone. I hope you learned some new information. Um, and I'm very happy I got to share some knowledge on this subject. So go out and be successful uh, colony managers of your rabbit breeding colony. Thank you, Catherine. I would also like to thank our sponsor, LabRoots, for making today's educational webcast possible. Uh, before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for three months from today's live event. You will receive an email from LabRoots when the webcast is available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again here soon at LabRoots. Goodbye.